All right. Welcome. Welcome to me because I was late. Um, the Flow of the Covenants. I found uh, this is an excerpt from my second book, which I was going to bring to shamelessly plug, but I forgot to bring one. But anyway, there, this is a section of, out of that book that I kind of tweaked a little, expounded on a little bit here, but uh, expanded it a little. But uh, I just want to talk about the Flow of the Covenants. And uh, they do flow. There was a word, I'm going to come to this word in a little bit, that sparked this. This word will be coming up in a little bit. But there was a word that I discovered when I was reading about the Abrahamic covenant. And I realized these covenants flow together. They flow from one to the next. And uh, as we go through here, I'm going to talk about three threads. The first thread that I want to keep some continuity through all these covenants is recognizing that God's plan is to one day bring his government on earth, the kingdom of God. And in order to have a government on earth, to have a kingdom, you need a people. Can I touch the mouse too? Or no? No, I have to touch the wheel. Because I never remember which way I have to turn the wheel. Oh, no, I just hit the left mouse button. Oh, I like that better. So you need a people, a land, geographical location from which to govern. You need some laws. And uh, you need leadership, a leadership body uh, to implement so, uh, your society. The second thread that I want to talk about is that God has a name that needs to be protected. His great name needs to be protected. It is very important that he protect, uphold, preserve, these are just my words, keep, defend, and over uh, and all, I put this in bold, to cover. What does it mean to cover his name? And the only reason I'm using this word is <clears throat> to encourage anyone who has not done so in this vast audience uh, to look into Nathan's teaching on the cherub that covereth. And uh, it's very interesting that that was Satan's original job, was to cover God's name. I think that was just a fascinating lesson. Another thread we're going to keep in mind as we go through here is obviously is right division. We can't do anything without dividing correctly. So here's a, just a little chart there. This is really crude, but just a quick little rough uh, chopped uh, with, a, uh, with an axe. Uh, breakdown of what Israel knew. With, I'm sorry, what, uh, yes, what Israel knew. When you read the, the scripture, Oh, that one didn't translate correctly because that's all off. Anyway, um, what they would have known is you got your Old Testament scenario unfolding. You get to the cross, gospel period, the Acts period. All they knew is that, that this is the kingdom of God. And we roll right into the uh, next thing, which would have been the tribulation period and the parousia. But the problem is, is this is what we know to be the case. And that there is this section right here that got sandwiched in between the, this is all off now, that's too bad, but the, uh, the Acts period and the Gospel period got interrupted by the secret period of the dispensation of grace. That's unfortunate that that didn't turn out right, but oh well, we'll get over it. So, this is what Israel knew, this is what we know, it didn't go very well because of the uh, Lack of uh, translation because we went from Mac to PC and sometimes that happens. Did anyway, you, did you make, so huh? Did you make them widescreen? I don't know. No, hmm. should have made them widescreen. I'll try that next time. No. It's only the ones with the uh, like multiple layers on them, like the balloons on that front thing. There's all different layers on there. But anyway, here is what I want to try and show for it is how the Noah covenant flowed through into the Abrahamic covenant, which then flowed into the Moses Mosaic covenant with Moses. I have a small Davidic. I'm not going to talk about the Davidic covenant. There definitely was a specific in, uh, uh, covenant made with David, but 
I'm just going to think of that as being under and within the Mosaic Covenant because nothing really changed other than God relented. His initial intent was to govern Israel through judges. And he kind of more, he did, he relented and allowed kings because Israel complained loud enough and they, they wanted a king. So I, it, it's not really germane to, to what I'm trying to get at today. So, uh, and then that flows right into the new covenant, which is uh, synonymous with the manifest kingdom of God. So the flow of the covenants, here we go. We're going to talk about the problem, the promise, the terms, the blood, the sign, and the purpose of all these covenants. So what is a covenant? Webster's defines a covenant as a formal, solemn, binding agreement, a written agreement under seal, interesting, under seal, two parties or more, and performance of an action. So I think it's just interesting that seal is even in there because we're going to talk about that a little bit. And the word I'm going to use is sign, but that's kind of a seal anyway. All right, so first off, no way a covenant. God and Noah. So, uh, got to use the mouse. So, we have a problem. Here's God after he created mankind. He looks down on the earth, the uh, world that he created. And there's nothing but evil in the hearts of men. He's wondering, is there anyone that could worship me? Worship me? Is there anyone that longs to know me? And he actually becomes sorry that he ever made man. You can read about that in Genesis 6. Also in Genesis 6, a little back, a little verse to support the wickedness of man's great on the earth. Every intent of uh, the thoughts of his heart, man's, was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man. He was grieved in his heart. Plus, there were giants in the earth. If anyone here has not studied the uh, concept of the Nephilim, the giants on the earth, another very good word study. Uh, so the earth is really not the earth in the world that he made. So there were giants in the earth. Uh, and they were uh, born to the daughters of men from uh, the sons of God. So this is a whole topic, if you haven't looked into it, that's extremely interesting. So the Lord says, I will destroy man who I have created, both man and beast. It's funny that uh, the animal world is kind of innocent in this whole affair, but boy, they sure have suffered because of the sin of mankind. Okay, so that was the problem. Here's the promise. God sees Noah and his family, and he sees Noah as a just man who walked with God, and uh, he decides to choose Noah as the person that, through his family line, that he will work through to be the vehicle to uh, fulfill his uh, to fulfill his intentions for mankind and the earth. So uh, on this exact date, 600 years in Noah's life, second month, 17th day, it's the 17th of, uh, what month is that, second month? You know the second month off the top of your head, the Hebrew calendar? Um, no big deal. No. This is the you know exact date in here. Uh, he, the the uh, fountains of the deep were broken up, and it rained for 40 days. The rain falling on the earth was not the issue. It was all this water that was coming up from underneath the earth. From the uh, another side a side note, if anyone has not looked into Walt Brown's hydroplate theory, it'll blow you away. We could probably put a link in the, on this when we put it up on YouTube. I don't know if we want to do that or not, but. Uh, so uh, he says, okay, so here is the covenant. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons, your wife, your wife's uh, sons and your wife, their wives, and uh, take every living thing. All flesh will be with you, two of each on the ark. Keep to be kept alive. They should be male and female. We all know the story. This covenant is not only between men and and God, men on earth and God, but it's also between God and all flesh on earth. So it's a little unique in that it's all flesh that's being cons uh, cons uh, entering into this covenant. Um, 
So it's with every living creature. And so I make a big deal in my book, not so much in this presentation, but I, and I did say what the definition of a covenant was, and it's an agreement between two parties. Well, how do you, can you have an agreement with, uh, with the animal world? So here you can so just another another verse to support what we're getting at here. Uh, the covenant includes that he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. So the terms, what are the terms of this covenant? Well, interestingly, there are no terms for men to keep because it would be difficult to enter into a covenant that had terms for animals to keep. So uh, it, the, it, this covenant is between man, the earth, and all flesh, and all three of those are are made uh, clear that that's who the covenant is with. So how are you going to have a covenant with animals? I would say on a side note, I don't know what, uh, I'll throw it out to the group, just something to think about. Could it be considered a term to the covenant when, when Noah left the ark, he was told to be fruitful and multiply? It might be a stretch to call that a term to this covenant, but if you were going to dig for one, that possibly could be in there. But I remember Kathy challenging me on this when she was helping me or she was editing my book and she got to this section and I make the point to say in my, uh, my this book is about covenant theology and why I reject it and support dispensational theology in favor of covenant theology. And one of the things I say in there is that uh, these covenants that covenant theology have, de have uh, devised, they s they're, they're not covenants, they're just things that God said he would do or a promise that he made that to do this or to do that. And it's like, that's not a covenant. Well, then I got to this section of the book and and there's no terms for a man to keep. So Kathy calls me out on that. Hey, you said you got to have terms, uh, you know, something for each party to agree to to call it a covenant. My answer to that was that God can call this a covenant if he wants to. But when men devise theological devices and say, this is a covenant of so-and-so because God said he... Well, the Bible doesn't call that a covenant. How can you call it a covenant? The Bible calls this a covenant, so I have the right to call this a covenant. Even though I don't see any terms for a man to keep here, God does call this a covenant. Okay, the blood. Covenants in Scripture are always ratified in blood. Here's just a few examples from Scripture. If anyone wants this presentation to have the Bible references and stuff, please let me know and I'll email it to you. So let me know afterwards. And Definitely can get this to you. So Noah builds an ark. And the Lord took all the uh, animals. And uh, so here's the blood. This was the blood atonement associated with this covenant. There's always blood associated with covenants. And this was the burnt offerings that Noah made when he got off the ark. And uh, I've heard people say, hey, he took two animals, two of each. And now he's giving sacrifices when they came off the ark. So what good did that do to him? He's killing them anyway. I think it was in one of Nathan's precepts he answered that brilliantly, is that there's earlier in the text, it tells Noah to take seven of this kind and five of this kind or whatever. So there were extra animals on board for this exact purpose. God's got it covered. So what's the sign of this covenant? Here he says, I set my rainbow in the cloud. It should be a sign. So. Here's the word, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, flip you. Here's the word that jog, or that kind of sparked my idea about these covenants flowing together, and it's the word remember. And I found it first in the Abrahamic covenant, but uh, then I started looking around and I saw it in the Noahic covenant too. So he sets the rainbow in the sky for the purpose of when God looks at the rainbow, he'll remember the covenant that he made with every living creature and all flesh that is on the earth. And we're going to get into that just a smidge more when we get to the Abrahamic. Okay, well, the purpose of this covenant, well, mankind was a mess. There are giants on the earth. Uh, wickedness. It all had to be destroyed. And this was uh, the right judgment of God to uh, set forth punishment and rid the earth of uh, this wickedness of man and the giants on the earth. And he also, in doing it, he preserved life on the earth. He preserved the human life, race, and the animal life. And this is all for the purpose of uh, moving forward with his plans for the earth. And the other purpose, 
is all throughout this, one of the threads, is to preserve, protect, honor God's great name. If his name has to be protected, he couldn't destroy all of earth. So he creates this world, he creates the earth, he puts, creates man, puts him on it, and man blows it. Adam falls. And it's like, all right, I'm just going to wipe this whole mess off and start over. No, God's not going to do that because it would be a besmirch, a besmirching of his own name if he was to do that. He refuses to have his name besmirched in any way, so he, instead he uh, protects and uh, continues with man. The, line, the family lineage or the line of, of uh, human race. So here's just some examples. I'm taking a little bit of a side road to get into this protecting God's name a little bit before we go into the next covenant. But uh, he put, I believe he's talking to uh, Aaron and, and Aaron's sons here. So he's talking to the priesthood in Israel when he says that they shall put my name on the children of Israel. That was one of the jobs the priesthood had was to have his name associated with the nation of Israel. Just looking at the highlights, I do this, oh, this is Ezekiel 36. Everyone's familiar with this rebuilding with the dry bones in, in 36 and 7 especially, uh, the restoring Israel as a nation and uh, putting the flesh metaphorically back on these dry bones that have been dead for so long and bringing them all back to life and bringing them into the land. Look why he's going to do this. I don't do this for your sake. He's doing it to protect his holy name and uh, the name you profane among the nations. I will sanctify my great name. The nations shall know that I am the Lord. And when I am hallowed in you, respected, revered, worshiped, hallowed, in you before their eyes. This is the nation of Israel. This was what his intent for this nation has always been. For my name's sake, for my praise, for my own sake, for my own sake I will do it. For, and this is Isaiah 48 now, it's not Ezekiel anymore, but uh, just some examples of his name being protected. My name, my glory. This is just another sampling of, I actually got kind of like, this is so much, I can't put them all down. I put a sampling down of all the verses that talk about his great name or protecting my great name or whatever. So don't pollute my name, I just found the one. Don't profane my name in Leviticus. He makes a city for his name, a house for his name. So obviously we've got Jerusalem, we've got the temple in Jerusalem. For my name's sake, just as a general uh, statement. So we'll get into the Abrahamic covenant now. Um, again, we have a problem. We start with problem. Uh, just a few centuries after the flood, at the Tower of Babel, God's got a problem with mankind again. Uh, he'd scattered mankind on the earth. Um, they are all gathering at the Tower of Babel. He wants them to scatter and migrate out. And uh, that's not happening, so he comes in and uh, Again, he looks down on the earth and wonders, who's there to worship me? Who's there to long to know me? Ah, oh, but he sees the family line of Abraham, or uh, the family of Abraham. He's been following the line of Shem since the Tower of Babel. And uh, that's where we get our word Semitic. I think it's connected to that somehow. Uh, so the line of Shem is where uh, Abraham came out of. He sees Abraham. The promise to him is that he would enter into this covenant with him and it would be an advancement of the Noahic covenant. He's going to move forward with his plans for mankind. And this family of, of uh, Abraham is going to become a nation and they are going to be a people for his name, the vehicle through which God would restore the world back to himself. So in order to do this, we obviously need a land. We need people and descendants. Uh, this is what he's promising. I'm sorry. He's promising Abraham land, people to, to live in this land, and they are going to be his descendants. And then he's promising to bless them. So they came into the land of Canaan, passed through the land in the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were there in the land, so the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. 
another verse to show that he plans on giving this land to his descendants. To your descendants I have given this land after making the covenant. Uh, and, and this is a much broader, you look at the borders here, this is much bigger than what they've got today. What, where they are today is a little postage stamp size piece of land that they were originally giving. That whole, that whole Middle East area is, was theirs, has been promised to them. So uh, yeah, it's much greater than even what they have today. God didn't put them where they are today. Man did. They drew some lines after World War II and reparations kind of a thing. So it's another mistake that a lot of people make trying to put prophecy into what's going on today. But so here's a, here's the promise. He said, I will make you a, a well, this is part of the blessing part. That's why I pulled this one out. Make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in all the families in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So lots of blessings and greatness there. I just thought that was a great verse to show what he's promising. He said, I'll make my covenant between you and I'll multiply you exceedingly. This is the descendants promise. He's going to have a land. He's going to have descendants. Multiply you exceedingly. You should be a father of many nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Kings will come out of you. This is a promise of his offspring. And remember, he's 90 years old when this is going down. And you're like, what, what family? What kids? I don't have any kids. Well, it was 90 by the time Isaac was born anyway, right? Um, so another example to, uh, to, God, uh, to be God to you and your descendants, I shall give to you and your descendants after you the land. So just several verses there to kind of bring that home, what he's promising. What are the terms of this covenant? So what are the terms for, uh, for Abraham to keep? If God's going to promise all this, he says, this is my covenant with which you shall keep and your descendants, every male child among you shall be circumcised. So the terms of the covenant for Abraham and the descendants of Abraham was to be circumcised. Again, now this is going to set them apart from the rest of the world and to make them unique and marked out, physically marked out as a people for God. I kidded with Nathan and Terry after prison one time. I said, Judaism is absolutely the only legitimate religion that has ever been ever. And it, I can prove it. And they're like, what are you getting at? I'm like, circumcision. That proves that that had to have been from God because no man would ever come up with this religion. Hey, Bill, what do you think we do? What do you think we do this? And uh, mark ourselves. I was like, no, this isn't going to happen. So this is it. I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> that uh, it's just such something that man would never think of. Uh, so, whoops, my bad. I'm lost. All right, just another verse to say the same thing. It says, my covenant shall be in your flesh. That's how serious this was to God. He wanted it to be physical in your body, in your fleshly form that you are. Wait, the blood. Another aspect that I'm trying to build on here. Uh, this is the uh, blood sacrifice associated with the Abrahamic covenant. And it is in Genesis 15 where he brings a, turtle, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, cuts them in two, puts them on each side, and they walked through it or something like that. Oh yeah, down the middle, cut them in two, down the middle, placed them on uh, opposite, opposite sides of each other, but he didn't cut the bird. So he took the ram and split them in two, and that was the blood sacrifice associated with the Abrahamic covenant. I don't know if it's intentional, but a three-year-old ram kind of interesting. The Lord's, uh, there's so many pictures of the Lord here. His earthly ministry lasted three years. I don't know if it's intentional or not. But. So what is the sign associated with, with the uh, Abrahamic covenant? Here's a hint. Ouch. I just talked about it. The sign and the terms are the same in this covenant. They just happen to be the same thing. But circumcision is the sign of this covenant. And again, it's, he marks these people out to be his. So, the purpose of this covenant, well, he's building a nation of people through whom he can work. He 
promises them a land that he can work in and through them in. And uh, he ensures that they would prosper through the blessings that he said he was going to have. He promises to be their God and that they would be his people. And again, the purpose? To protect God's great name. And the purpose is because we are moving forward with God's plans, his intentions for this world and mankind upon it. And that is to eventually work towards this ultimate goal of bringing the kingdom of God on earth. Mosaic Covenant. I, this picture killed me. I sort of snagged this off the internet and it's like, what? Somebody put an Apple Watch on Moses, I guess. I, that just cracked me up. Or this is Moses in the future, in the kingdom. I don't know. <laughs> After that, and that, it was a much bigger version. That's probably That's Apple 8.10 point something, whatever. <laughs> All right, so the question I'm asking is, did the Abrahamic covenant, uh, did God enter into this covenant with, uh, with Abraham so that Israel could have this special place with God and that they alone would have a relationship with him? Well, of course, we know that's not uh, his intention, that his intention was that they would be the vehicle through which the rest of the world would come to know God. And I think most of Christendom misses this. I really do. I think, well, he was working with Israel there, and now he's working with Christ the Christian church here. Uh, they're just different things. There's no, doesn't seem to be a lot of continuity, and they've kind of spiritualized everything the way it goes. Oh, we're spiritual Israel. And he says, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of different ideas out there. I'm just saying, if you really understood that God was working in and through Israel for his purposes, I think there's just a, a clearer path to understanding the Bible if you do, if you understand that. So we got a problem again. We got Abraham. He's been set apart for God's purposes. They've grown into this nation of people in Egypt. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant is about ready to ex expand to the next stage now because we're in the Mosaic covenant now. So we got a problem because uh, they're in bondage in Egypt and they are not in possession of the land. These were just promises under the Abrahamic covenant. They have no government. There's no leadership. They're in bondage in Egypt. So what, if they tried to have a government, it would be a joke. So God moves forward with his plans and he said, this is the one I originally saw. God remembered his covenant with Abraham. This is why I'm saying there's maybe some validity to these flowing covenants, flowing one from another. Because we saw that God put the rainbow to always remember his covenant with Abraham. And now he's saying, I remember my covenant with Abraham and I will move forward with you and establish another covenant with you moving forward. They're not just new, separate, completely different things that God is doing. We're flowing from one covenant to the next, building on a theme, building on a purpose. Here's another verse that says the same thing. In their groanings, if they were in bondage, in the mud pits or whatever, uh, he remembered his covenant and uh, acknowledged them. So Israel is supposed to be a special treasure unto God. There's supposed to be a kingdom of priests, a holy set-apart nation, and a light to the Gentiles. And the verses for that, Exodus 19, he said, I'll be a, you'll be my covenant with you, and you will be a special treasure to me above all people. The earth is mine. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I keep being asked if I want to join the Wi-Fi, and then my computer's locks up. Um, so now the verse that says the same thing that, uh, I'm sorry, it says the last uh, bullet point that I had, that, that they were to be a light to the Gentiles. Now this portion of the covenant has to be kind of searched out a little bit outside of the uh, Exodus 19 passage, but uh, it is still associated with this covenant because they're to be a light to the Gentiles, to the nations. So that was uh, the promise. And so what are the terms? So what are the terms that uh, Israel is supposed to uphold for their portion of the Mosaic covenant? There's a hint. There's ten of them. We all know the answer, right? It's the ten, what became known as the Ten Commandments. 
Now, if we get our, th our theology from Charlton Hessen or Cecil B. DeMille, who made the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to... Hi, my name is Bob, and I'm a recovering slacker concerning Bible study. I used to get frustrated, or I never quite understood when I was first learning about the t ten terms of this covenant, or the, the law that it became, I never understood because Moses went up to get him, and he come in the movie, and he comes down and he's about to give him to the people, and look what, it's a mess, so they never even got to know what the, what they were entering into. That's not true, and I didn't learn this until I became part of the group that we're involved in today, the Word of Truth Ministry, learned this from Nathan, that in Exodus 24, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. This is before he ascended up to get the tablets and just to be with the Lord. The Lord gave them to Moses, and he gave them to the people, and all the words, and this is what they said with one loud voice, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. They just agreed to the terms. They shook hands with God in a covenant by saying that they would do this. And here's another one, Exodus 20, uh, I think this is the next verse, isn't it? A couple verses later, 20, uh, verse 3, now in verse 7. Uh, he, Moses, took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and we will be obedient. Well, as we all know, that didn't work out. They didn't hold their end of the bargain. But the purpose of these ten terms, and it, you know, we'll just say we understand now that those ten terms became the law in Israel. God flipped it from being an agreement and a, and a uh, working together to while well, you broke the covenant and he continued to bind Israel to the terms of those of those ten uh, terms but it now has become a law and a burden for them to keep it would have been a blessing in America and we're going to get to how this all unfolds here but right now in the Old Testament under Moses this is still wow what a bummer we got all these laws and we're not going to be able to really uh, enjoy the uh, blessings that were promised to us. So the ten terms were basically to uh, teach Israel how to worship God properly, how to have a relationship with their fe fellow Israelites and, uh, and their neighboring nations. So what was the blood associated with this covenant? Well, uh, all the sacrifices in Judaism. I mean, you look throughout the whole Old Testament, it's, uh, you know, we, we've had sacrifices up until Moses, but they were individually instructed. And the, uh, the Lord says do this, the Lord said do that. But now that we're into Judaism, it's now a ritualistic ongoing. You knew that you were to bring an animal if this happened. You knew you were to do this. All the feasts you brought animal sacrifices for. So I would associate the blood in this uh, covenant to the religion of Judaism and all the sacrifices that occurred there. This is just an example. Hebrews is just such a synoptic uh, narrative to describe what they were all about. He, you know, and Moses spoke every precept to all the people according to the law. He took the blood of calves and goats. And, uh, and he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And he sprinkled the blood on the tabernacle and the vessels. And he says, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission. So Israel is now under this ongoing, the blood is really starting to come to the into view as being a part of what God's trying to do here once we got to Judaism. What's the sign of the Mosaic Covenant? Here's a hint. Rest. It's the Sabbath. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between you and me and throughout the generations. So we've got the sign of the covenant. Uh, I'll back it up to Mo, uh, the Noah. Uh, we've got the rainbow. They have promised to continue with man. He's never going to destroy the earth with a flood or, or, the, or mankind on it. As another sign with circumcision, marking out the family of Abraham, and now he's got this sign added to it. Now we've got circumcision and 
the Sabbath to mark them out as a unique people that God is working in and through. Another verse is to say that this is a sign between me and the children of Israel. So, again, what's the purpose of this covenant? Well, now Israel, not just promised in the Abrahamic, but now for, uh, now it has been fulfilled. It's been, we're moving forward. He's, they are in their land. Granted, they had a little detour. They were brought to the, to the border, and they chickened out, if you will, and they wandered for 40 years. There was multiple purposes in that wandering. But they are finally in the land under this covenant, and they're getting guidance from God through the leadership. The Hebrew word kahal, I meant to put that in italics and say Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word kahal. Uh, so under that leadership, we have religious, civil, and moral guidance. And in a nutshell, what do they have here? They have a, a working government. So now, God can uh, guide Israel through pillars of smoke, through fire, through priests, through judges and kings. And I, I put kings small like I did just to stay consistent because I made David small before. Uh, the Kahal really uh, intended to be judges. Um, prophets, angels, which are messengers, God's messengers, and even theophanies, which are basically manifestations of Jehovah God himself on earth. They, there were several times. So all, through all of this is how God is, see that didn't translate again. These, there's supposed to be three arrows that pointed to the word kahal. Again, I'm throwing this out for any of you that have not, I know almost everybody in this room is such a small group, but for the YouTube audience, uh, the word, Hebrew word kahal is a complete and perfect uh, parallel. Interchange. Pardon me? D divine interchange? Divine interchange. It's a uh, uh, law of divine interchange. When a Hebrew word is quoted in the New Testament using a Greek word, we know that those meanings of those two words have to be the same. Very, very similar. They might not be exactly 100% the exact same thing, but they have to mean the same thing. So the kahal in Israel were the priests, the judges, and then eventually kings, and the prophets. They made up the kahal in Israel. And when we see that word quoted in the New Testament, it's the word ekklesia. The word ekklesia is translated church. So this is what Hebrews Seven, the church in the wilderness in the old King James. Forget, it's a Hebrew something, I think seven. What in the world's the, the church in the wilderness referring when uh, Stephen is quoted? Or is it in Acts 7 with, he, with Stephen? So anyway, there was a church in the Old Testament, strangely enough. So here's the purpose. Israel is to be so entrenched in God's ways that they are able to teach the world who he is and present him to the world. Again, to be a light to the nations, a light to the Gentiles. But because of Israel's sin at the foot of Mount Sinai, they broke the covenant. So the terms that we mentioned earlier, those ten terms to the covenant with Moses, they became the law in Israel. And again, the purpose, the thread throughout the whole thing, to protect God's great name. So Israel would continue to be obligated to the original ten terms, now it's the law, but they're not really enjoying the benefits that God had originally agreed to. Because they broke the covenant, he wasn't obligated to do anything with respect to them being, continuing to be blessed, continuing to be a, a nation of priests, a nation, a, a special called out nation of treasure unto him, and to be a light to the Gentiles. Yes, there were some ups and downs when it seemed like they were being blessed, and not so much. There were ups and downs with the leadership, the priests and the uh, prophets in the, uh, in, the, in the nation of Israel. There were times when it was going the right way, but then there were times when it would all fall apart too. So not at this time can we say that those promises have been fulfilled. We are moving forward towards the kingdom of God on earth. The new covenant. 
Well, of course, we all know the new covenant is associated with Christianity. We uh, just go online. I just grabbed a few images. Images of the new covenant is what I Google. I didn't get one thing that referred to Israel. Not one picture that had any reference that it could have been anything to do with Israel. Churches and academies, and we know we know the law is written in our heart today, right? We're, we're Christians. Uh, this is a Christian thing. Well, is it? So I asked the question, is the new covenant realized through the Christian church? Well, that's what my new book is about. I, I'll have to put a tag, uh, a link to that book on the YouTube site. It's right here. <laughs> it better be there, right? So here again, we have a problem, don't we? Israel was to be God's representative nation uh, to the world. They were supposed to be that special treasure unto God. They were supposed to be a nation of priests, a holy set-apart nation, and a light to the Gentiles. So what happened? What's the problem? Why didn't... Why didn't that uh, happen? We just talked about it. It's because they broke the terms of this, of this covenant that promised all of these things, that promised all the good stuff to Israel, these blessings. So what does Israel need? They need that covenant to be restored. Otherwise, he would literally have to be done with them. And this is where the break between dispensational and covenant theology really takes a divide, as they say there's no restoration involved. It's just God turned his back on Israel, and now he's doing something with, with uh, the Christian church. So, but the problem with this is that the new covenant was promised long before the Christian church was on the scene. And, a minor detail, it was promised to Israel. Spiritual Israel does not cut it as a sufficient answer to the problem here. Because the Lord says that I, we acknowledge, oh Lord, I, oh, this is awesome. Right before Jeremiah in 31, this is verse uh, chapter 14, so uh, 15 chapters earlier, uh, I can't, 16 chapters earlier, 17 chapters earlier, math failure, <laughs> 17 chapters before he delineates the new covenant. And I'm going to, that's the next slide. But right in the same book, this is Jeremiah talking to the Lord. We as a nation acknowledge, O Lord, our witness and the iniquity of our fathers. For we have sinned against you. Do not abhor us for your name's sake. That's why that thread was so important to me. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. I should have underlined and highlighted that sentence too, but I just didn't. Remember, here we go again with remember, do not break your covenant with us. Well, that's a pretty bold statement. Jeremiah is uh, in humility. He's not wagging his finger at the, at the Lord, but in humility he is saying we know we've sinned. We know we don't deserve any of this. But he's pleading with the Lord, remember your covenant. Don't break it. Well, they already broke it, but he's still just asking for the Lord's grace. Mm -hmm. So there's remember again. So here it is. This is the, 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 the covenant that he makes with Israel. He says, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant. With who? The house of Israel, the house of Judah. I love Andy, whenever spiritual Israel comes up as a discussion, he goes, yeah, well, look at the new covenant. Who's it with? House of Israel. Okay, your spiritual Israel? Who's spiritual Judah? I, just, I cracked up when I heard that. I thought that was awesome. Good for you, Andy. He's not here right now. But, uh, so this is a time when the nation was split in two, when this statement is made. When you look at this being quoted in Hebrews, it doesn't need to say the house of Judah because they're reunited under the first century uh, Israel that we know of in, in uh, Scripture. Okay, so not, this is not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day. I took them by the hand, led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husbandman to them. We, not, uh, I'm sorry, where did I go? Went backwards. Did I go backwards? Yeah. I don't know which way I'm going anymore. That's why I don't like that this was wheel. It. You were just on Jeremiah 31, 31, and that was 31, 33. Okay, so 14 is where I was. 
Right? Yeah, so remember. So now, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, this is where it's, so the covenant that they broke, and I'm just continuing, this is the, I just couldn't fit it all on one page. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Clearly, we're talking to Israel. You have to have been an Israelite in order for this promise to have had any meaning to you. And this is the people whose uh, hearts and minds of the law will be infused into. No more, this is just continuing on with this covenant promise. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. So many in Christendom today believe we are under the new covenant or in the new covenant or we're bringing in the kingdom. It's like none of this can possibly apply to today. You don't have to bother. Why, why would you bother wasting your time telling somebody about the Lord? They all know the Lord. Everyone on the earth knows the Lord. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity. That's the part you hear quoted a lot. Oh, the Lord's forgiven our iniquity. Look at Jeremiah, the new covenant. He's forgiven our iniquities. Well, yeah, yes. I'll sin, I will, in their sins I remember no more. But the rest of this language, this does not fit at all. All right, so the terms of this covenant, since this is a restoration of the old covenant, I'm, I am uh, contending that the terms are the same terms. This is still the old covenant that we've moved past and continue on. Um, I don't know why I have that in there. What's the blood? So what's the blood associated with this covenant? There's been blood associated with every covenant, right? Okay, I'm kind of giving it away with a who. There's no hint needed, is there? If anyone has a clue about anything with regard to what they believe in Christ, it's the blood of Christ. And again, Hebrews summed this up really well, that the, uh, if the blood of goats and uh, ashes of a heifer sanctified the purifying of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And this is the reason he became the mediator of the new covenant, by the means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. What? Christ's blood is for the transgressions of the first covenant? I thought it was just to forgive us of our sins. Well, of course it is. It's that. But this verse is referring to the fact that this covenant needed to be restored and that's what, the, that's what this verse is referring to, the aspect of the finished work of Christ's work on the cross, the aspect that the writer of Hebrews is getting into in this passage is the restored covenant. So it must be recognized that before Christ shed blood could or would have any significance for the greater Gentile world, it had great significance and, and maybe a, an initial significance uh, for the broken covenant that Israel was in uh, in trouble with, with the Lord. So this is the restoration of the old covenant, so I say the sign. So the terms and the sign, I think, are both kind of still associated with the old covenant. So what's been the purpose of God throughout Scripture? Uh, what's his goal for mankind upon the earth? What is it that when we read from Genesis 1-1 all the way to Revelation 22, whatever, uh, what is it that we see God doing? What has been his goal? What has been his purpose? What has been his, if we have been looking at these covenants as flowing from one to another, what's the purpose? Hint, it's found in the passage that is said over and over and over and over and over and over and over in churches everywhere. We all know that verse, don't we? Maybe? I don't know. It's the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, I should have underlined and bolded this one, too, because I was using that as one of my big threads, is the hallowed be thy name. That's what this has all been working towards, the kingdom of God on earth. The, per, the prayer that he encourages his uh, disciples to, to uh, pray is that, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. All of those things on earth as it is in heaven. 
all of those things they're praying would happen on earth as they are in heaven, that his name would be hallowed, that his kingdom would come, and that his will would be done. So what would you expect when his kingdom comes? Well, nobody's going to go hungry, nobody's going to be in debt, nobody's going to be in, uh, have someone in debt to him. They, uh, we're not going to be led into temptations. We're delivered from the evil one and, and the Lord's government and his power and his glory is on earth for the eon. So that's a pretty uh, awesome time to look forward to. This is the manifest kingdom of God on earth. This is the government of God on earth. This is the day when God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what the new covenant is. When I learned that, it was like mind-blowing to me. The new covenant is actually the kingdom of God on earth in this form. When you start seeing it on all these verses, like this, especially this Matthew that's recited just mindlessly, they don't even know what they're saying. They're praying for the kingdom to come. So this is also the day when God's great name is finally preserved, protected, and honored on earth as it is in heaven. So just a couple conclusions. Uh, the flow, we flowed from the covenant of Noah where he had to make a correction on the earth. He was sorry he made man. He starts over, but he protects man. Protects the flesh on earth. Both animal life and uh, humankind. And he promises to never again destroy the earth with a flood. So I'm uh, flowing into the Abrahamic covenant. He's now made a choice of a people. And he promises them a land. A little typo there, that's not the Spanish government. Governmental. <laughs> it's uh, capital zero is a apostrophe and I missed the cap. But anyway, a land, a nation, and a blessings have been the promise through the Abrahamic covenant, but they still don't have it until you get to the Moses Mosaic covenant, which fulfills the land, the government, and the leadership, but still there's more promise. We have a special treasure under God, a holy nation, a nation of priests, and a light to the nations. None of that happened under this covenant because they were promised, but they never were fulfilled due to the breaking of the covenant. So this all is delayed due to the breaking of the covenant by the nation of Israel. So when we get to the new covenant, we finally see all of this finally come into fruition and into uh, a reality on earth. We have land, we have government with a leadership to execute that government, uh, implement that government. We have the nation of Israel being a special treasure unto God. We have them being a holy nation set apart for God's purposes. They are a nation of priests, which are basically a go-between, a mediator between the world and uh, God, and that's how they can be a light to the nations, a light to the Gentiles, because they're priests. They can actually represent God on earth and uh, bring them to God. So Israel, what was that last thing I said? Israel is finally the people, the nation, that God has always wanted them to be. So we are finally at the place where God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. Sorry, one last. Uh, this great name is also preserved. Head, keep the threads going there. So that's it. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> so that one word, remembered, sparked this whole. I got to dig into that and find out what's what. I just, I got, I, as I did it, I was convinced these covenants flow together in a way that I've never seen before. Just kind of thought, wait, I made a covenant with Noah, I made a covenant with David, he made a covenant with Moses, there's the new covenant. Well, they're all, they're all there for a purpose. They're all trying to paint a picture for us and put the pieces of that puzzle together for us.